The Dayton Strangler was an unidentified serial killer active in Dayton, Ohio during the early 20th century. Between 1900 and 1909, the killer was responsible for the deaths of five women and one man. Ada Lance, the daughter of a prominent local carpenter, was discovered dead in a vault in her family's backyard on October 14, 1900. The previous night, while her parents hosted a party, Ada slipped out of the house unnoticed as the adults played cards. Thirty minutes later, her body was found. She had been brutally beaten with severe bruises and a scar from a blunt weapon across her face and had been sexually assaulted. Multiple suspects were arrested, including a man named Emmons, who had been seen standing near the Lance home by two women. A year later, 18-year-old Harrison Blessing was also arrested at a Germantown saloon after a tip from William Hanna, a bicycle shop owner from whom Blessing had stolen a wheel. Though Blessing allegedly confessed to the crime, he was released due to lack of evidence. On November 20, 1906, 20-year-old Donna Gilman, an employee in the bindery department at the National Cash Registry Works, left work to head home. Usually accompanied by her sister, Fane, who was unavailable that day, Donna boarded a train with friends, traveling with them until her transfer at Arlington Heights. From there, she switched to another train, reaching a point near her home before mysteriously disappearing. Her disappearance was particularly puzzling, as she had written a note the night before to her lover, Stanley Anderson of Sharon, expressing her eagerness to see him that Sunday evening. That same night, a neighbor of the Gilmans, Robert Keyes, reported hearing sounds resembling a struggle coming from their home. Shortly after, Donna's body was discovered in some weeds about 200 yards from her house. Nearby, across the street, her gloves and umbrella were found. Authorities quickly deduced that Donna had not died at the spot where her body was found, as the area was visible from many homes. It was suspected that she was murdered elsewhere, likely in a nearby house, before her body was dumped in the weeds. In their search for clues, police cordoned off the area, and Cincinnati sleuth William S. Heitzman claimed to have found a book Donna had been reading during her ride home. Despite several arrests and even a confession, no one was ever convicted of her murder. On August 4, 1907, 24-year-old Anna Markowitz, the daughter of a pawnbroker from Covington, Kentucky, was walking with her boyfriend, Abe Cohan, a traveling salesman from Indianapolis, and her younger sister, Bertha, along a desolate road near the National Soldiers' Home. As they strolled through a secluded area in Macabre Park, chatting, a man suddenly crept up behind Cohen and struck him with a baton. Startled, Abe turned, only to be shot twice in the stomach. The attacker then turned his attention to the sisters, but Bertha, terrified, fled to find the sheriff. A posse quickly formed and returned to the scene, where they found Cohen lying, gravely injured. Nearby in some bushes, they discovered Anna's body. Evidence shows that she had fought fiercely before being assaulted. Her clothes were torn, her arms covered her eyes, and she had been strangled to death. Cohen was rushed to the hospital, but he was so dazed that his statements were incoherent. He died two days later from his injuries. The only significant clue came from Eliza Virus, a housekeeper nearby, who reported hearing gunshots and a woman's voice crying out around 10 p.m. that Sunday night. The voice, she said, called, Harry, Harry, oh Harry. Despite this, the identity of the mysterious Harry was never uncovered. Leighton Hines, the man convicted of the double murder, was later proven innocent. On January 24, 1909, 15-year-old Mary Geppert, an employee at the Kling Tobacco Warehouse and described as unusually pretty for her age, left her stepfather Robert Geppert's home in North Dayton. She was carrying a Dayton Savings and Trust Company deposit book with $9 to place in the bank. After leaving the house, her movements became unclear, and when she failed to return, her parents grew alarmed. Robert Geppert, along with neighbors Arthur Heyer and John Merkel, formed a search party, not notifying authorities until midnight. By then, Lieutenant Haley had dispatched officers, but before their arrival, Robert noticed disturbed soil, which led to a trail ending on the estate of Grafton C. Kennedy. Using his lantern, he found Mary's lifeless body. The coroner later confirmed that she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Two witnesses, Sam Morris and Mrs. Jones' chef, claimed to have seen the assailant. 
Morris reported hearing cries around 6.30 p.m. and saw a man sitting on a fence watching a dark spot in the field. When Morris approached, the man threatened to shoot him. After retrieving his shotgun and firing a warning shot, Morris returned, but the stranger had vanished. Mrs. Sheff recounted that after stepping off a train near the same area, a man emerged from the darkness and chased her until she reached her home. Around the same time, another woman, Mrs. Powers, was attacked, but was saved by her husband, James. Though the perpetrator escaped, Mrs. Powers was left with torn clothes and bruises on her throat. During the autopsy, the coroner determined that the killer had unusually large hands from the finger imprints wrapped around the victim's neck. Four days later, a Pennsylvania Railroad detective reported seeing a man matching the description getting off a Dayton train in Springfield. The suspect, a black man with a bandaged hand, scratched face, and corduroy trousers, similar to what the killer had worn, was never found. On February 7, 1909, 18-year-old Emma Fullhart from Vandalia arrived in Dayton in search of work. The day after her arrival, she mysteriously disappeared. A week later, two workmen uncovered her body in an old cistern wrapped in a gunny sack and floating in the water. She was pulled from the manhole and identified by her brother. What made the case unusual was that Fullhart was fully clothed but missing her undergarments suggesting that the killer had redressed her before disposing of the body in the cistern. Authorities initially struggled to determine the cause of death, as there was no typical signs of strangulation seen in previous victims. Various theories emerged, including suicide, poisoning, and the possibility that she had been thrown in the cistern alive with the sack tied around her head. The murder shocked the residents of Dayton, leading to a significant decline in church attendance among women and at night, almost no woman ventured out unescorted. Following Fullhart's death, the string of killings came to an abrupt end. Despite numerous arrests, and even a wrongful conviction, the murders remain officially unsolved to this day.